And thanks for all of you for staying to the end. Um, so there, here's the final highlight of the conference. And we have two talks. And Jomi told me that he will start with the Congress of Vienna from 1815 onwards. So we're moving through time. We start uh, early on through historical. Yesterday we had already a lot of historical perspective. I think it's more from a European perspective. Jomi is uh, at Pompeo, and he will talk about globalization, state, and the future of Europe. So this panel is about Europe. And then um, so Maya Keynes will take over, and she's well known for her trade talks, and uh, you can listen to. And she's from The Economist, and she will focus more on the more recent events. And later on, we will have some Q&A focusing on the more recent events. So show me the floor is yours. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the, the organizers for inviting me to this very nice conference, in which, um, and in particular to be in this panel that is on the future of Europe, and I would like to uh, tell you a little bit about some research that I have been doing with some of my colleagues that have a bearing on this matter. And as Marcus says, yes, indeed, we will start uh, early on and give us a historical perspective. So the plan is the following. I'm gonna provide you like an overview of some of the research uh, about the effects of globalization on the state. Then I'm gonna focus more on Europe and then I'm gonna say what this sort of research, uh, pro what kind of this research gives you as a, as a food for thought for some of the current issues in Europe. So let me start uh, by focusing, let me see. Okay, I'll use this. Let me start by focusing on globalization. If you take a look at the graph that you see here, you see um, this line, this line is merchandise trade as a share of, a, of GDP. This line uh, goes indeed from 1815 up to basically nowadays. Um, and it shows what historians call the two waves of globalization. Okay, so the first one started with the Congress of Vienna and went through up until the First World War. The second one starts at the end of the Second World War and we are still immersed in it. Okay, so this is what we call the two ways of globalization. Globalization has had a lot of impact in markets and we uh, have seen, for example, the discussion uh, that Danny Roderick had before and we have a lot of papers on the effects of immigration, on wages and so on, looking at private sector at how firms react, how the, how the public uh, reacts. But a big uh, part of economic activity is given by the government and one wants to think about what are the effects of globalization on uh, the way that the state is organized. Let me start by one particular fact that arose, that created a lot of, a lot of literature about uh, 20 years ago, about uh, 15, 20 years ago. And this fact was the observation that in the second wave of globalization, now you can see this blue line that has appeared in your screen, this blue line is the number of states in the world, okay? Is the number of countries that are in the world. And if you take a look at this line, this line shows you that the second wave of globalization, economic and political integration have gone hand in hand. So basically you see that at the same time that trade booms, the number of countries grows from between 50 something up to a maximum today that is close to 200. This observation led a number of uh, uh, researchers to work on the issue of how does globalization affect the size of the state. And I want to show you some of the conclusions of this research. This research basically took some of the main uh, results or the main ideas of fiscal federalism and argued, and it wrote a number of very beautiful models, that try to argue that the equilibrium size of a state trades off two opposing forces. On the one hand, you want to have a state that is large because there are economies of scale. There's economies of scale in the provision of public goods. There are economies of scale, uh, for example, in defense. And interestingly also, because borders tend to have a very negative effect on trade, this is something that we know that we are trying to measure and that every measurement we do, it seems that borders do matter. 
And as a result, uh, all of these factors would like to induce countries to be large so that you have less borders, so that you take advantage of these economies of scale. But the theory of fiscal federalism also mentions that there are reasons why you don't want to have countries that are very large, and the reason why you don't want to have countries that are very large is because there are heterogeneity in preferences. And it's very well known, it's very well known that large countries uh, have a challenge in providing public goods that are uh, sufficiently heterogeneous to satisfy all the, all the regions that the countries have. And as a result, what they, what they looked at said, well, this type of model will generate optimally, like we always economies do, we always look for trade-offs, what's the optimal situation, and there will be some sort of optimal uh, size of country, which would depend on a bunch of parameters in the models. These models have a number of parameters, very realistic. But basically, what was interesting about these models and what I want to, what I want to emphasize today is the fact that one of the determinants was how important was the border. And in this art of literature, uh, for example, the work uh, by Alessina and Spolaore, Alessina Spolaore and Baxiark, showed that as the border effect becomes less important, borders are less of a nuisance, and as a result, you want to have smaller countries. That's the way they interpreted the evidence. In fact, for them, globalization was a reduction of this border effect. Globalization was suddenly that the government was less of a nuisance when we wanted to trade across different locations. There were at the time a number of other papers that also put forward other ideas which are interesting, some more, some less. For example, the work of Casella and Casella and Feinstein argued that as we trade more, we specialize more. As we specialize more, we become more different. Somehow, a specialization in production makes us more different, and we want, to, uh, we want to separate. And that was one type of theory. It didn't go that far empirically, but it seemed like an idea. The other type of theory was a, a very nice paper by Walton and Roland in the QGE that argued that globalization creates more internal conflict based on a Hexerolin type of idea. And as a result, it makes it more likely for some of the regions to succeed. In fact, the whole literature was built on the notion that globalization or economic integration leads to political disintegration. But now, let me go back in time. And let me take that blue line and let me project it backwards for the beginning of the sample. Well, once you do that, you find that the first wave of globalization, exactly the opposite occur. In the second wave of globalization, economic integration led to political disintegration. But in the first wave of globalization, economic integration seems to be associated with political integration. So what is different? So what is different between these two periods? How do we think about this? Applying the simple theories that we were using that we were using to explain the second part of data don't allow us to explain the first part. And actually, this is where some of us have done some work, and this is the work for which I would like to mention here. One of the, one of the I, I want to mention one thing. One of the things is that we see that uh, in the first wave of globalization, so, uh, the number of countries is declining. We also see that in the second wave of globalization, if you take that this a green line is, for example, this green line here is the number of countries that are members of uh, some free trade area. One of the interesting aspects of the second wave of globalization is also the emergence of a supranational state. We have now tons of treaties. We have international institutions in Europe. This is going to be especially important. It's going to be the poster child, and I'm going to say a few things about this in just a minute. But what we see is a fact that there is, in the second half, uh, the second wave of globalization, the disintegration of countries and the appearance of a number of treaties, international, uh, supranational institutions that constrain the policies that governments do take and use. Now, one of the elements that I think, and I want to put forward as an hypothesis, that the earlier models were missing, is a third element in this equilibrium trade-off. And that's what, uh, with my colleagues uh, Gino Gancia, and Giacomo Ponzetto, we've been working in the last couple of years. We've been working on trying to understand what is it, what is it that the earlier theory may, missed that wasn't capable to see that sometimes we react to globalization with 
political integration and sometimes with political disintegration. Now, the third element, the first two economies of scales, border effects, heterogeneity of preferences, is already there. The third element is economies of scope. In principle, we know from public finance that we would like to organize the state in a set of overlapping jurisdictions or clubs where basically every service is provided at the right scale. The reason why we don't do that is because this is very costly to have different territorial uh, jurisdictions. One, for example, for health, another for education, another for the police, another for uh, cultural goods, another for pensions. Ideally, the right jurisdiction is not the same for all these activities. If there are economies of a scope in ju just putting all these activities together in a single institution, which we call the state, and do it. But obviously, when the a scope of different, uh, the scope of different activities becomes very different. Perhaps there's a moment in which you want to start moving towards a state with multiple jurisdictions. And once you do that, then you have to, that's an element of the theory. Let me put that in uh, again. Ideally, we might want to do a different territorial jurisdictions. We want to do in different territorial jurisdictions, different activities of the state. A second thing that actually I think that most of us would agree is that globalization is proceeding at different speeds when it comes to economics and when it comes to culture. I think that when it comes to economics, markets are becoming truly global. We've seen through the conference a lot of discussion of that. We've talked about immigration, we've talked about uh, trading goods, we talk about finance. Markets are becoming truly global. And actually, when it comes to the markets, we all love variety. That's what we write in our models. When it comes to private goods, there's love of variety. But when it comes to public goods, there seems to be variety of love rather than love for variety. We all still have, we all still have a desire to have institutions that are close to our culture, to close to our way of thinking, or way we look at the world. Everybody thinks about whether the European Union, for example, should go deeper or not. But we're talking about the economics. We're not talking about the culture. Uh, imagine just it's, it's totally bizarre. And the fact that it's bizarre is what makes the point to think, for example, of a cultural union in Europe. Imagine that the markets remain separated. But we all decide to use the same education to our children, to talk the same language, to adopt the same customs. That would be absolutely unthinkable. But that's just a reflection of the fact that globalization is working at two speeds. We are, the market is becoming truly global. Well, our views about how the work, government should operate, the, the right amount of welfare, the sort of institutions that we want, is still very different as you move across Europe and around the world. Once you have that, you have a mismatch between the extent of the market and the extent of the cultures. And what happens is that at some point, perhaps what you want to do is to break the state in two levels. A level that deals with market, market regulation, and a lower level that deals with institutions, with the choices that we want to do and the way we decide how much welfare do we want to have, what kind of pension system, or what kind of health or education, and so on and so forth. And in fact, once you put these economies, the scope in the market, and you put two speeds of, of this, the model delivers exactly these results, not surprisingly. This is what it encapsulates the view. And it shows you that initially, at early stages of globalization, we want to take advantage of larger markets and more defense by expanding the size of the countries. That's cheaper than creating expensive two-level state. But it comes to a point that globalization has gone so far that the countries are very large and there is a, a, a tension between regulating the market which is larger than the countries and providing the appropriate cultural goods, the ideas, uh, institutions and so on which are much smaller than the countries, the regions or the or the, so, and at that point, in the model, a two-level state appears. Uh, that's the way that globalization, that we couple with that. So in, in a picture, if we, we can think of that in the in globalization, um, in, the, in the 19th century, meant having large countries that deal with everything, markets, defense, law and order, welfare, culture, but the new state in the 21st century seems like a state in which is going to have a whole set of overlapping jurisdictions, a larger set of supranational institutions that regulate markets and defense. NATO is clearly 
uh, and defense today in Europe is at a larger level, well, there's going to be probably smaller countries that are going to uh, basically deal with all these other issues where this, uh, uh, that deal with uh, more, uh, less of a market or economic issues and so on. Let me just see whether this makes any sense for Europe. And I'm going to do an empirical test. And this empirical test is going to be eyeballing a few maps. Okay? So let me just look at that. This is Europe at the con when the Congress of Vienna took place in 1915. Napoleonic Wars are over. The winners uh, sit down, they divide Europe, they divide actually more than Europe, they divide <laughs> a little bit the world and everything like that. And what do you see? Well, you see a European state. Well, you see colors. Each color is a country. How does it look like? Does it look like big countries or smaller countries? Well, some of you are going to see that Germany still was not Germany. The Italy was still not Italy. Now let's fast forward for a century. And let's continue this empirical exercise. And what do you see? Ooh, the assumed, do you see political concentration or do you see political disintegration? So that's what we see uh, from the Congress of Vienna to the First World War. Now let's continue this empirical thing. Now let's move forward 100 years and go from this period towards today. What do you see? Well, you see again a, a, a situation of political disintegration, which uh, the previous data I gave you was a data for all countries in the world, but in Europe it is particularly telling. And if you remain only with this view, you would say, well, this political disintegration. But I say, no, this is not political disintegration because you need to know what the next slide, the next slide is the creation of Europe. If you take a look at this map, is the appearance of this supranational entity, which is the European Union. If you look here, I don't know how well you guys can see, but basically the first blue guys are the countries that originated. Then you see the yellow uh, ones that are Ireland, the United Kingdom, and Denmark that entered a little bit later. Then you have uh, Greece, Spain, and Portugal, uh, Finland, uh, Austria, and Sweden. Then uh, you see the transition economies. Then you see Romania, Romania and Bulgaria. You see Croatia. And the gray ones are the ones that are trying to get in. But as you can see, there is a growth in this union, a union that is basically in principle to regulate the single market, the economic issues. So now let's take this perspective and see what are the challenges for this Europe. I see in my view, and in the view of my, of my, of my, um, of my co-authors and the view of uh, those that we are doing this research, the state is transitioning from a 19th century state, which was basically the time of the nation state, to a 21st century state, which will not have countries in the way we understand them, at least in Europe. It's going to be a maze of overlapping jurisdictions that will deal with different issues. Obviously, if there's something that is slow and has inertia, it's political structure. It takes time. It takes a lot of time to change that. So we are, we, this is a trip that has just started, I think. I think that there are, it, we are we're well in the way, but there's a lot to come. And actually, there's a lot of issues that we need to deal during this transitional world in which we're going to have an inadequate structure. We are in a situation with global markets and more or less local cultures at some levels. That's when you have countries that are in between, they are too small for the markets, they are too large for the cultures. When you have a mismatch between the borders of the countries and the, and the place and, and your effect on policy, that's the recipe for bad policy making. That's the recipe for externalities. Because you are taking decisions that go well beyond your border. And under that situation, we know, we, we pay a lot of attention to terms of trade externalities, for example, in all our work. Uh, for example, Danny was talking on the effects on the size of the state of globalization. He was talking about a bargain uh, earlier on. Well, some people think it's not a bargain. People think it's just one bad externality, that when you raise taxes, actually, when you, when you open up and you raise taxes, part of the cost of these taxes are shifted to the rest of the world. That's what the typical terms of trade argument give you. There's a nice paper by one of my co-authors, Gino Gancia, with Paolo Pifani in the Review of Economic Studies that actually discusses that point and shows how the growth of the state with um, globalization can come as an 
inefficient outcome, not as a bargain. The two are nice theories. The two should be checked at some level. As we live in a world, at some level, we as economists, well, always when I think about these topics, there's always a the first question that comes to my mind, the cost theorem. It doesn't matter what happens. Things will be efficient if we can trade with each other. Why, does, why do political borders at the end matter if we all can deal with things, and we are all represented, of course, eh? we are all represented uh, somehow, then uh, we can do optimal trades. But that doesn't seem to be uh, something that um, something that seems to be uh, a characteristic of today of today's uh, economy. I'm going to mention that another issue for the transitional world is how to you redistribute property rights. One of the key issues, which I'm, is what is the role of the different layers of government? How is the role of, for example, the old states, regional governments? What is the role of the union? How do you redistribute that? With that goes a redistribution of power, redistribution of wealth. Uh, we see that there is a lot of reluctance to make these changes. And I'm gonna, ask, I'm gonna finish with a couple of thoughts about uh, Europe. One is about the growth of the union, whether there's gonna be further enlargement or whether there's gonna be contraction, like the Brexit, we are getting out. Is the Brexit an accident? Or is the Brexit, for example, uh, a fact that is coming from the fact that costs of trading are going down a lot, and actually the Union is still a pretty protectionist. The European Union is pretty protectionist vis-a-vis -vis the exterior. And actually, at some point, the incentives to be inside when you, are, you can be outside in a world where there's a lot of trade uh, might not seem such a bad idea, for example, like a country like Britain. Or is it an accident? and what is going to be the implication. I think that the, at the essence of that is the fact that the Union, the European Union, is still perceived as a club of countries where the citizens do not participate directly, and that makes it lack legitimacy. And as long as the European Union is not going to attain this level of legitimacy, I think that there's a very good chance that people will still be reluctant uh, to be uh, members or to strengthen the European Union. Also is the issue of the power within the Union. There is a hollowing out hypothesis on that, which I've heard a few times and actually is totally, I've heard it a few times in, in informal discussions and so on, but that's actually consistent with this theory. When the old nation state becomes a bit obsolete, you want to move some powers up to the, up to the larger jurisdiction in which you pass uh, the regulation of the single market and all of that, you want to pass some powers down to the regions, and that might be one way in which we transition to the new state. That doesn't look easy as of now. The union is not getting powers from the countries. The countries are not releasing powers downstairs. Why? Because obviously any redistribution of power is a redistribution of wealth, a redistribution of... of uh, uh, it affects some winners and some losers that have mechanisms. How do we handle that? Another part of the hollowing out hypothesis is what you see in the movements of many countries or many parts of Europe that perhaps want to separate, like Scotland, like Catalonia, where I'm coming from, uh, that feel that we, the, the countries where we are no longer uh, regulate markets or regulate defense, and the only thing that they do is uh, to let us not choose, not, not let us choose some of the things that we would like to choose. This is a feeling that is going around in some places in Europe. Do we need to break to do that? Can we do it within the same framework by this hollowing out? This is an unclear and a very important challenge. And most importantly, whether at some point we will agree on whether this change in the balance of power, which I think is inevitable, I don't know if in five years, 10 years, 20 years, how it's going to happen, uh, to what extent will be done through conflict or through democracy. I think that probably agreeing on that is probably the most important challenge for Europe today. Thank you for your attention. Right, hello. Um, so I'm Samaya Keynes. I cover economics and trade for The Economist. Um, and in the summer of 2016, I spent a month in Lebanon. So I have family there, uh, but this wasn't holiday, this was work. Uh, the Economist sent me to cover a region. There, there was a gap between correspondence, and the idea was that I would fill in 
And, and at the time, the Lebanese government was, was so dysfunctional, it hadn't had a government in years. Uh, the refugee crisis was ongoing. I wrote a story about tens of thousands of refugees trapped in this kind of no man's land between Jordan and Syria, trying to kind of escape this hellish war zone. Uh, I wrote stories about corruption, about poverty and war. It was, it was a fairly kind of harrowing time. And, and as I talked to people, uh, this really strange thing kept on happening, uh, which is they, they kept on saying, don't worry, it'll be okay. Uh, they, they kept on sort of telling me how sorry they felt for me. And that was uh, strange. Um, you know, as the Middle East was burning, they, they felt sorry for me. And, and that was probably something to do with my emotional state at the time, which wasn't entirely due to what I was seeing in the Middle East. So I left for Lebanon a week after uh, June the 23rd, when Britain voted to leave the European Union. And, and I think my mood was fairly well reflected in The Economist's coverage, so I don't feel kind of too guilty about telling you my personal story. Uh, so I, I remember the mood in The Economist's newsroom the day after the vote. It was, um, I think, funereal is, is the word. And, and there, was, there was one cover that I, I particularly remember, which is, was actually the week before the referendum. Um, and it was this, this image of two flags tightly knotted together, uh, a British one and a European one. And then the words were there, Divided we fall. So looking at all of this in the Arab world, I suppose, you know, Britain, Europe, they were supposed to be better than this. They were supposed to have risen above the kind of nationalism that was destroying uh, the Middle East and, you know, all these other, these other problems. As, as a side note, there was this kind of hilarious phenomenon that I found where lots of kind of very senior Arab politicians would explain to me why Brexit was because of the Middle East. Um, and I'd sort of scrunch up my face and say, mm, it's maybe a little bit more complicated than that, but sure. Uh, and, and, you know, and at the time, even aside from Brexit, the EU seemed like a fairly gloomy project. Uh, so Pascal Lamy said at one point that, you know, the East-West divisions created by the refugee crisis could prove even more divisive than the Euro crisis. Even today, immigration is actually one of the, you know, the biggest problems. If you look at polling within the EU, you know, it, immigration is seen as a much bigger problem than kind of unemployment or the other economic problems, which, which surprised me. Back then, Marine Le Pen was doing worryingly well in French politics. The AFD in Germany, Golden Dawn in Greece, Law and Justice in Poland, they were all on the rise. There was an Austrian far-right politician who only got 49% of the vote, and this was meant to be some kind of... <laughs> you know, huge cause for celebration. And this wave of populism was, was partly blamed on the flaws in the EU and, and particularly on the Eurozone. Um, you know, the idea was that this common currency had failed. It, 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 its institutions had been insufficient to kind of cope with the problems that it had generated. And, and finally, this populism, this wave of populism were, were people, people fighting back. So, you know, after the, Euro the Eurozone crisis brought the single currency to this kind of the brink, um, here was the political backlash. And so here we are, 18 months on. Uh, you'll be happy to hear that Brexit is going great. Uh, my country's government has astonished everyone with its pragmatism, its competence, and its clarity of vision. Uh, so much so that in spring, uh, I'm actually going to be moving to the U.S., uh, so I'm, I'm going to be covering the, uh, the, the U.S. economy for The Economist, yes. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm hoping that my, my British sarcasm will translate. Um, that said, so things seem to be going slightly better for the EU. Uh, you know, the economy seems to be on the up. Uh, the latest ECB update on economic and monetary developments talks of strong cyclical momentum, broadly balanced risks... Employment is now just above where it was at its peak uh, in 2008, with, it, with a caveat that youth unemployment in places like Spain, Italy and Greece is still fairly high. Um, you know, that rising employment is supporting private consumption, exports are growing. Um, you know, so it looks like, uh, you know, if you look at what people think, trust in the European Union, trust in this institution is slowly recovering. So it fell a lot between 2007 and 2013, but it seems to be seems to be on the up. And, and interestingly, I hadn't, I hadn't known this either, but uh, people, still send, people still tend to say that they trust the European Union more than they trust their national governments or their parliaments. Uh, and and uh, in, in 2011, 
sorry, one final stat. Uh, 48% of EU citizens surveyed said that they were optimistic for the future of the EU. So that's 48% in 2011, and now that's 57%, right? So people within the EU, at least according to these very, very blunt surveys, seem to be increasingly optimistic. Um, and politically in Brussels, people, still, people seem to be a bit chirpier. Uh, fine, the UK seems to have taken leave of its senses, uh, but, but while I remember, you know, as the... In the, in the lead up to the vote, as someone was predicting that the UK leaving would herald the collapse of the whole EU, actually the reverse seems to have happened. It seems like actually Britain's departure has has kind of, you know, ruffled everyone's feathers and said, hey, no, we're, we're fine. We'll do just fine without you. Thank you very much. Um, and, and, you know, given, given how obstructive the UK has historically been to some of the efforts to increase European integration, actually maybe in some areas it, it, could, be, it could be a help. And, and, you know, then we have France. So when Emmanuel, Emmanuel Macron won, you know, the mood in Brussels was kind of giddy with joy. You know, this, here's our saviour. He's going to come in and fix everything. This is, this is great. And, and now we have a German coalition that has been agreed in theory, and the SPD will, will vote in it in, you know, the coming days and weeks. And all this means that in Brussels people are talking about this window of opportunity, this window where people are going to come in and we're just going to fix it. We're going to, we're going to reform it and we're going to fix it and it's going to be, it's going to be great. Um, and so the hope is that um, I think in June they're hoping that the, the Eurozone's finance ministers will, will pass some kind of reform. Um, so they have a, a window until June or maybe September, right? So, so now is the time to be carving the... The, the new version of this institution. If they miss that window, then they probably have to wait until 2020, and by then, who knows what will have happened. So, you know, urgency, now, now is the time. Because, you know, as we all know, the economic numbers I just told you, that doesn't really tell you much about the long-term economic health of this institution. That's a, essentially a cyclical upturn that took a really, really long time to happen. Um, you know, there was a lot of hardship on the way, it's, you know, it's not the case that everything is rosy now. Um, and it's very, very far from clear that if another shock hit, then those old, re those, those old vulnerabilities wouldn't resurface. It's, it's not the case that, that the problems that, that led to that crisis only a few years ago have, have gone away. So, in Economist Leaders, you are supposed to come up with three points. Um, an editor recently told me, don't worry if you think there are four, just shoehorn them into three and you'll go far. Uh, but luckily for you, this isn't a leader. <laughs> uh, and the Eurozone's problems number many more than three. Um, so I'm going to take Barry Eichengreen's lead from a recent essay he wrote for the Milken Institute and list five. So, number one. So I'm about to list the, the problems of the Eurozone. So number one, to put it mildly, it's got some financial stability issues. Um, so banking union is incomplete. There's no common deposit insurance. Uh, it's not clear whether the old problem of banks being international in the good times, but national in the bad has been solved. There's the doom loop, this kind of link between banks and the sovereign where they pull down each other in a crisis. Uh, that doesn't seem to be any weaker. Um, and actually since the crisis, banks exposure to their own sovereigns has risen. Um, as a share of their portfolio. Problem, on, problem number two, debt. <clears throat> so on average in the EU28, and please don't make me strip out the UK just yet, uh, in the EU28 it's 83% um, and it's 89% as a share of GDP in the Eurozone. Greece, Italy, Portugal, all well over 120% of GDP. That's, that's high. Uh, and at the moment, that is being supported by a low interest rate environment. You know, clearly, the sustainability of that debt depends on a lot of things. That, that level doesn't necessarily tell you anything. But it is the case that at the moment, that is being supported by a very low interest rate environment. And that could change. So of the, you know, the main risks that um, uh, investors gave when they were surveyed by Moody's in a recent a uh, recent survey found that, that you know, the, single, the single biggest risk they identified was that the ECB tightened faster than was expected. And the second one was that there was some kind of political crisis in Spain or Italy. Uh, you know, Macron beat expectations in France, and that's lovely, uh, but Renzi doesn't look like he's in such a good position. Problem number three, its fiscal rules are more weird than wonderful. Uh, so they were supposed to protect the Eurozone against irresponsible borrowing, and then 
on the one hand, you have people saying that they were too soft, they, the sanctions were never applied, you know, the moral hazard that they were supposed to correct, you know, that, that uh, ran rampant. Uh, and then on the other hand, people say, no, they were too tough, and they, impe they impeded adjustment when the crisis got really bad. Problem number four, it lacks a financial fire brigade. So at the moment, it has this thing called the European Stability Mechanism to help, to help countries in crisis. And that's lovely, but there are really strict conditions attached. So you can only get help in a very, very, very deep crisis. Germany, France, and Italy still have a power of veto, and you need to do structural reforms to get any help. And there's no backstop. So the backstop is, in theory, funded by members' fiscal contributions, and they could run out. So, you know, Greece is one thing, fine, design your backstop so you can solve a problem with Greece. Italy's a bit bigger than Greece. Uh, you know, the, the, the phrase too big to bail has been uh, bandied around often enough to be, to be alarming. Problem number five, it lacks a way to adjust to asymmetric disturbances. So when a shock hits, there just isn't a mechanism to spread the pain or a way for the hard hit countries to adjust. They can't devalue their currency. Um, uh, the studies that have looked into this find that in the core, kind of the uh, in the core, it looks like some kind of risk sharing is going on. Consumption's moving roughly in line with income, but in the periphery, uh, no, sorry, in the in the core, it looks like there is insurance, right? So so consumption is kind of. Uh, not taking all of the hit as, as income varies, but in the periphery, consumption is taking pretty much all of the hit, uh, which shows that they're just, you know, when, when their income is going down, there's no mechanism for them to smooth. Okay, so these are five fairly big, general, vague problems that, you know, everyone's identified. Uh, and this window, of this window of opportunity has uh, created this huge demand uh, that people have met for ideas to fix it. So uh, everyone is kind of throwing the hat in the ring and saying, I've got the answer, it's this fix or this fix or this fix. So um, at this point, I should mention how fun it is to start swatting up for a talk on the Eurozone uh, and then all of your colleagues recommending the one book you have to read. Don't worry, it's the best one, it's great. Uh, and you're like, fine, I'll read the book, wonderful, feeling really prepared, and then you discover that the author of your book is the chair of your panel, uh, and the other author is in the audience. So, uh, just, that's a really relaxing, that's a really relaxing thing to happen. Uh, but of course, <laughs> everyone, you know, my colleagues were right, it is a fantastic book. Uh, everyone should read The Year in the Battle of Ideas by Marcus, uh, Harold James and Jean-Pierre Landau. It's as good as they said, and he hasn't forced me to say that, uh, although he will be uh, fielding all of the difficult questions in the Q&A. Um, okay, so the book uh, paints this kind of philosophical divide within the Eurozone. Um, you know, between those who favour discretion and those who favour a rule-based order. So in, in the policy debate, that's that's sort of vaguely translating into a divide between people who want risk sharing and people who want risk reduction. So it's not just the technocrats that have given their solutions to the Eurozone's problems. You know, the French have some ideas of, ideas of their own. So Emmanuel Macron has some grand ideas. He wants to complete the banking union with this new system of common deposit insurance and bank resolution. They want this uh, fiscal fire brigade, the ESM, the European Stability Mechanism, to provide liquidity to the Eurozone's single resolution fund. So there's a kind of bailout for banks and there's a bailout for sort of sovereigns. And they want the, the one for banks to kind of have this extra pipe from the kind of emergency funds bucket that they've been constructing. Uh, they would they would really like some kind of eurozone level system of demand management, um, and and as as far as rules go, um, rules are great as long as they can be negotiated um, and renegotiated preferably. And one might question, you know, uh, you know, some sort of discretion infused rules is a sort of an interesting philosophically um, thing. Uh, but, you know, tougher fiscal constraints on national governments um, or being told what reforms to take are kind of less great from the press, from the, the French perspective. Um, and, uh, you know, the kind of economic uh, reason they dislike that, I suppose, is that um, they, they worry that, that a kind of, uh, that anything too tough will essentially generate self-fulfilling panics. Um, so if you think that uh, essentially lots of the Eurozone's problems are liquidity issues, 
uh, then kind of being very, very clear about who's going to take what uh, losses when things go wrong, that could make private investors feel really antsy and that could sort of start new crises, right? So they, they're very worried about that happening and particularly very worried about that happening in any kind of transition to a new scheme. Okay, so now take the Germans who assign a kind of morality to rules. As I say, you really should read the book to, uh, to get this uh, argument in, a, in, a, in its full form. Um, but you can, you can see this in the current debate, right? There's a, there's a, uh, there's a deep skepticism of anything that would ultimately lead to them picking up the tab for a responsibility elsewhere. So common deposit insurance, hmm, could that lead to the Germans bailing out some irresponsible Southern Europeans? Eurozone budget, euro bonds, they kind of all suspiciously sound like they could. Is this a backdoor way to the Germans essentially funding everyone else's consumption? So they, they worry about moral hazard a lot. So, you know, what, for example, if the central bank became a lender of last resort, so you, you solve this problem of a lack of a fire hose, and, and what if it became so intent on preserving financial stability, kind of bailing out these people in crisis, that that, that undermined monetary stability? And then what if, you know, the idea that they would get bailed out meant that in the long run, even that undermined financial instability, right? So those are the, those are the kind of German... Um, concerns. But luckily, no one needs to worry because the technocrats have come to the rescue. Uh, so as everyone has been weighing in on their, their ways to, uh, to fix the Eurozone, if I read another person talking about solidarity, I might poke my own eyes out. Um, and and, and so, so lots of proposals. And of course, the most comprehensive one is by Marcus um, and this kind of band of this huge band of economists, again, really relaxing, giving a talk on this topic. Um, so, to list some of the most interesting proposals um, briefly. So, so I mentioned before there's this doom loop. So, I'm just going to kind of list some of the interesting proposals. And again, if you want to ask horrible questions, then Marcus is, Marcus is your man. Um, but the, the one that I uh, actually have a kind of personal um, liking for is this, this, this kind of neat technocratic fix to, to, to solve the problem of the doom loop. Um, so at the moment, there's uh, a disincentive for, sorry, there's an incentive for banks to kind of hold whatever sovereign debt they want because there's no regulatory differentiation between different kinds of sovereign debt. They're all risk-weighted at zero. Um, and so, you know, if you're uh, an Italian bank, then sure, you'll just hold a ton of Italian debt because you know that your government's going to think twice before, um, before uh, giving any kind of haircut to that. Um, and so there's this, this fix going out there. So number one, you could create disincentives for banks to hold too much of their own government's debt. And that, I suppose, would be on um, kind of extra capital charges above, on holdings above a certain level. Um, and, and there there's a kind of uh, trade-off in terms of do you, do you grandfather it in and kind of minimise concerns about the disruption um, or do you do it immediately and risk uh, a kind of flight out um, of certain banks, which, which again kind of potentially falls foul of this French problem of kind of um, generating self-fulfilling panics. Uh, then there are European safe bonds, ESBs, um, which is this idea that you create these um, asset classes and you create two tranches of debt. So you have a junior tranche and a senior tranche. And then when times are tough, um, the junior tranche takes the first hit. And the senior tranche becomes this kind of safe asset that the European Union hasn't, the Eurozone hasn't really had. In, when times have been tough, everyone's just rushed into bonds, um, and that's kind of exacerbated some of the financial problems. And so this ESB's idea would be this sort of very neat fix that, and you know, they would say that the only reason this thing doesn't exist already is because of regulation, because all sovereign debt is treated equally, there's kind of zero risk waiting on everything. If you, if you changed that, or if you created some kind of regulatory incentive to hold these things, um, then, then maybe we could have this instrument and it would actually have some of the properties that, um, of an instrument that seems to be in demand. Um, so uh, that's out there. Uh, there are other kind of more realistic um, proposals. So the European Commission has a proposal for a common European deposit insurance scheme. So that would um, lend money to national schemes and recover the funds from other banks. Um, you know, the idea that banks' loss absorbency should be raised is fairly uncontroversial. Um, you know, dealing with non-performing loans, um, better rules for recognising dud loans, 
replacing the European stability mechanism with a European monetary fund, which, which sounds kind of like the international monetary fund, so it must fix everyone's problems, um, but it's not, you know, not quite the same. Um, there's this idea that since the Eurozone was so bad at dealing with asymmetric shocks, maybe you should have some kind of central fiscal stabilization fund. You make everyone contribute, and then you maybe pay out transfers if they run into difficulty and you, meet, you need to make sure that there's no incentive or no way to game the system. So perhaps you say you are only allowed funds from this, from this uh, group fund if, say, your unemployment rate goes up by a certain number of percentage points. Why not, if you're so concerned about countries doing their structural reforms, why not reward countries for good structural reforms, good policies, by giving them easier access to credit. You know, the stick of the, of the fiscal rules didn't, didn't really work. The stick of the, well, if you don't do your reforms, then you'll go into crisis, that didn't really work. So why not offer the carrot of, of easier credit if they do these nice policies that, that somehow everyone will decide? Okay, so those are just, the, I mean, that was a kind of fairly jumbled list of proposals. And, you know, there's some interesting ideas in there, but hopefully the idea is that, you know, this is a massive problem. Everyone's kind of firing fixes um, at, at this kind of big, uh, big problem. And, and a sort of a sort of let's throw in and, and sort of see what sticks. But the question is, you know, which one of these things are actually going to happen? And will they be enough to fix the Eurozone and restore the reputation of, of the EU and prevent the next crisis? Um, so luckily this isn't a leader, so I don't have to be extremely confident about the answer. So I'm going to say maybe and maybe. Um, and fundamentally, obviously, it all depends on the politics. Um, so there is some really, really stiff opposition to some of these proposals. So the Italians, for example, as I mentioned, they're, they're less keen that some kind of new approach to sovereign debt would somehow subordinate their debt. Their debt would be a pretty large chunk of this junior tranche of debt um, that would, would come up in these European safe bonds that I mentioned. At the moment, the Italian government has a buyer of last resort in the form of its own domestic banks. Right? Any change that somehow kind of undermines that, well, the Italians could say, well, hey, that's, that's fairly convenient in some cases. It's unclear how much of an appetite or even a mandate the German government will have for some of these things. So um, I put the uh, chapter of the German coalition deal through Google Translate, um, so I can report that it's not a perfect translator yet. Uh, but, you know, so th th that seems fairly positive on, on the surface. They call for a strengthening of European integration. Um, they're willing to contemplate higher German contributions to the budget. They want this parliament-controlled European monetary fund, that kind of, um, uh, sorry, enshrined in EU law being the, the specific point. So the, uh, you know, so some kind of better fiscal fire hose seems to be, you know, they're willing to contemplate that. And then, you know, it's, it's fairly vague. They talk about renewal and how important the Franco-German relationship will be. So that, that all sounds fairly positive, but ultimately they hold the key. And as in the French election, you know, the European Union was, was, was fairly prominent. Um, actually, it didn't feature that much, didn't feature as much in the German election. So, you know, if, if you were about to see the Germans sort of, you know, ride forth on their um, white steed next to, the, next to the French to fix the Eurozone, I'm not, I'm not entirely clear that that's, that's the mandate that was given by this most recent German election. Um, and, and so I painted this kind of ideological division between the French and the Germans, but obviously it's not just those two. So, you know, supposing they got something that was more akin to what the French wanted, then the Dutch might just veto it. Um, so, you know, th those are the, the two big ones, but, it, you know, those, although those are the big two that tend to make decisions in crisis, um, you know, in normal times, when it comes to fixing the Eurozone, you have to go through everyone. Everyone has to agree, and getting them to agree is difficult. And And... Um, it's also worth mentioning that on, on supposedly the easier reforms, the banking union, right, the thing that, that most people agree was going to be the first thing to get done, they already tried to start doing that and they got stuck, right? It's not like it's, even that wasn't kind of smooth sailing right to the end. Um, so there are big, big political obstacles to these things is, is, is the point. Um, and, and so the, the, um, 
So there was a paper by uh, Bruegel recently that was looking at, um, it, was, it was a recent, anal it was an analysis of narratives of the crisis. So it's by Henrik Müller, Giuseppe Porcaro, and Jere von Nordheim, I'm sure I've butchered their names. Um, so they were looking at how this is being discussed, right? So they were looking at the discussion of Eurozone reform as it was reported in the national newspapers of Spain, Italy, um, France, and Germany. Um, and I, uh, so, I'm, I know I'm going to butcher one of them, and then I'm going to be non kind of MFN, and uh, you know, do the other was fine. So I'm just not going to say any any of them. But okay, so so the 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 point is that you've got these these quite different narratives going on. So so the German newspaper that they analyze blames everyone but Germany. So Greece and the ECB are the villains. Um, the Italian one seems it sees Italy as the victim of its politicians, and Germany imposed austerity. Le Monde blames everyone, including the French politicians, and El País mainly blames Spain. Um, and I guess the, the, the point is that, you know, on the one hand, you've got all these technocrats kind of, you know, muddling through to, to a, a solution for these things. But on the other, you've got these kind of fairly separate spheres of debate. There's no European level public sphere. There are different languages. They're all happening in different silos. I mean, that isn't necessarily that conducive for some kind of grand convergence. Um, and in an environment of kind of national blame pointing, it's, it's really difficult to get change. There's political capital domestically to be had in being the annoying one who kind of, um, who saves, saves your, your country. And there's this kind of, um, so, so I've been, if you listen to trade talks, you would know that um, I uh, think about the World Trade Organization a lot. Um, and there you have, you know, the ultimate kind of silo situation where you've got the, um, you know, I was in Argentina for the for the latest ministerial meeting of the World Trade Organization. You had the Indians who turned up with all of their press corps, and uh, the minister basically was there to show his domestic constituencies that he was fighting on their behalf. Um, and that was that was kind of the main the main point. It was it it ended up being slightly divorced from kind of real policy discussions. And there was this hilarious kind of U turn at the last minute when the Indians realized that one of the policies that they were about to um, put through was actually fairly damaging to them. So, but, but basically there's a kind of disconnect between the debate and policy and that can be damaging and ultimately undermine the kinds of good policies that, that could actually fix things. Um, so some of these changes that are being proposed, they might be necessary, just, you know, necessary but not sufficient, I'm saying. So, so let's take the, um, the European Monetary Fund. So it looks like there will probably be, in the future of Europe, some kind of European monetary fund, which will be an improvement over the European stability mechanism, this kind of fiscal fire hose that I was talking about. It'll be bigger, but it probably won't go far enough. Uh, there won't be a full fiscal backstop. And so there's, there was a different piece of research by Jacob um, Kierkegaard and Adam Posen, who was looking, they were looking at the history of the US and what lessons that had for the, for the future of the EU. And they, they essentially pointed out that the, it was only when Roosevelt introduced reforms to provide unlimited support for the Federal Reserve and Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation did the redenomination risk go away. So that experience suggests that when you don't have a full fiscal backstop, stop, when you don't have an actual policy kind of backing up the whatever it takes that we heard from Mario Draghi, if you don't have that, then ultimately there's always going to be something. There's always going to be, you know, there's always going to be some outside risk of the Italy going under and you not being, being able to stump up the funds and you just can't get rid of that risk and therefore you're vulnerable to future problems. So I kind of, you know, when I, when I look at this, my kind of overriding worry is that this window of opportunity uh, is, is just not going to be enough to get us over these hurdles that I've, that I've just described. Um, so these, these fixes, often they're a bit boring and they're, they're quite hard to sell. Um, and that, that undermines momentum, essentially, towards reform. So political engagement in European elections is low and it's falling. Voters tend to decide largely on national, not European issues. It's kind of, it's a worrying environment in which to implement these new, quite big reforms that would try and, you know, really change these institutions. You know, with, with a full fiscal fire hose, you are basically saying, yes, we will stand by you in whatever situation. That's a, that's a kind of 
at least philosophically, that's a that's a big step to take. And meanwhile, European voters don't look that engaged. On on the kind of easy to sell point. Uh, so in my um, when covering European uh, trade policy, um, I was kind of thinking about European trade deals. And they had this interesting uh, situation where there was this, this huge backlash against um, you know, the TTIP. There were protests on the streets against this awful trade deal that was going to undermine sovereignty. It was going to be awful. And, and the European trade guys were, were horrified. They, they, they didn't know where this had come from. They were just stunned at this huge, huge backlash. Um, and what they've done since is they've identified some kind of simple things that are really easy to sell. Um, and it turns out that the answer is rock for. Um, so, so when they sign a new deal, they make this huge deal out of the geographic indications. So they, they say, don't worry, before the Japanese could make Roquefort, and it, and it would be fake Roquefort, and that would be bad, but we've signed this amazing new trade deal, and now the Japanese can't produce French cheese and call it their own. Um, and that's, you know, one of the devices that they use to sell, sell these deals. And I just don't know what the European Union's Roquefort is essentially, when trying to get these kind of fairly technical things through. And, and one of the reasons I'm worried about that is because we've seen that in some of these proposals, some of them, uh, they're kind of, they're complicated. So you say the original idea, so let's take European safe bonds. So the idea has been put out there, and then, and then it's essentially been, it's been struck down by everyone. And it's easy to invent some reason why it's not actually a good idea. So the Germans' response to the European safe bond idea, some Germans, was, wait, didn't this whole kind of securitized, complicated asset, wasn't that the thing that created all these problems in the past? And if you don't really know very much about it, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I think it sounds bad. And then it's kind of, it's another step more complicated to kind of step back and explain, like, oh, it's kind of, you know, the, you know it, it's complicated, is, is the point, and it's too easy to undermine. And that's why I worry. Um, so I've got two minutes left. And so the one, the one kind of final worry I have, which is that, um, so I, I mean, this kind of relates to some of Danny's, Danny's work, but uh, they're, one of the tensions in this kind of risk reduction, risk sharing problem is that, uh, you know, countries like the French, the Greeks, they don't really like it when they feel like someone else is imposing policies on them. And one of the problems with these structural reforms, so vaguely defined, if they're only defined after the, pri the crisis has come and the IMF and the ECB are saying, oh yeah, you can have your funds, but only if you do A, B, and C that hasn't been agreed on by, by voters, that feels, that feels very upsetting. Um, and one of the solutions seems to be, well, okay, fine, let's, let's agree on these structural reforms ex ante, um, and get, which you have to do if you're going to kind of set up your carrots um, to make those happen. Um, but it's, it's kind of unclear to me whether those structural reforms will be any easier to get through without an extreme amount of discomfort. You're still going to have the political problems. And in good times, it's not clear that we're going to have the crisis that is the thing that normally means that you have to, you have to do what people say. Right? There's not, don't waste a good crisis. There's a reason people say that. It's because people do stuff when they really, really have to. Um, and so, although, you know, in theory, you know, the good times is when you repair the roof, um, you know, the, the reason I'm pessimistic, uh, and again, you know, uh, living in Brexit land for so long may have just sort of clouded my overall outlook, so you should come to your own, uh, your own views. Um, uh, you know, it seems like the politics time, timing is, is right, but it, it might be just, just the wrong time. Um, and uh, now I will leave Marcus to conclude. Great. So thanks a lot uh, for the excellent presentations. Uh, I thought before we start with Q and A, I, I will throw in some two questions or some observations, and then we open it up right away for all of you to have uh, questions about Europe or more generally about states. Uh, as well. So the first aspect about uh, to Jamie is uh, what's about the subsidiarity principle? So you talked about these multiple layers, but Europe was founded essentially with the subsidiarity principle. Isn't it very 
essentially the, the principle you would like to have. So you can still have the nation state in charge of certain tasks and have a common king. I don't know whether Catalonia wants the Spanish king. Uh, but then certain tasks are always moved down at the lowest level as possible. And that's, you know, was agreed upon many, many years ago in Europe. And perhaps you can allude to this, how your principle fits to that. Of course, it makes uh, the whole arrangement much more maze and much more complicated, as you called it. Um, and we also have seen during the Euro crisis that actually the willingness to share risks is, is limited. There might be a willingness to share some certain tail risks. Uh, that's essentially possible, but more generally the share risk is, is limited and might be much more pronounced within an area, within a nation state. So for, so Marsh, you mentioned very much the window of opportunity. Um, I was wondering uh, to what extent actually Brexit and Trump was a unifier uh, for, for Europe. Uh, I have the impression that because of Brexit and because of Trump, suddenly the rest of Europe said we have to come much closer together. And you saw it was not only Macron, but Macron together with these outside threats essentially helped a lot also from the Eastern Front, uh, from Russia and the Ukraine problem. So it, it was essentially a unifier. And if you look at the next steps in the European Union, it seems like getting something done on the economic side seems very, very difficult, but getting something done on the defense side seems much more doable. And there's, you see already first steps, and in particular, the Brexit helped on this a lot because essentially UK was blocking uh, many steps in this dimension. And then let me open it up right away for some urgent questions, otherwise we... Uh, we start. Does anybody? Harold? This is a kind of follow up uh, to, to Marcus uh, because we obviously uh, talk together and in some ways think in the same direction. Um, I, I, I loved the discussion of the economists having three, three points that you had to make. And you're standing in front of a desk which says Woodrow Wilson. And Woodrow Wilson had to have 14 points. So um, if you think of it in Princeton, you really have to be very complicated. But in a sense, where you were going with your five points, the, what, that really wasn't enough. The, you, know, you could have extended it to 14. And uh, you know, in, in a sense, that's the answer, I think, to Marcus's question, that uh, the Eurozone on its own the debt problem was really impossible to solve. Uh, but once you've got the other crises and once you've got the security crises, you do something that's like a kind of trade negotiation that some countries will lose on one and gain on another, and, uh, but it will be reversed. You know, not every country will lose on every deal. And so there's the possibility of having a kind of grand, grand bargain and uh, it's exactly bringing the security in. And there's a specific point that you raised in the fifth of your points about Europe not having a good adjustment mechanism, which is obviously basically right. Uh, but there is a kind of adjustment mechanism in Europe which is deeply dysfunctional. And it is that if, you, if you're a country in crisis, um, a lot of your young people leave. And uh, so they, they go somewhere else. And that, with these appallingly high youth unemployment figures, that reduces the youth unemployment. Um, but uh, it puts a big emphasis then on the debt question because they're essentially walking away from national debt. And if you think about the, the, that and you know what that requires as a solution, it's something else. And when you referred to Roosevelt, um, I thought the thing that you were going to say with Roosevelt was social security. And the federalization of social security in the United States really creates a way in which transfers can be done without them looking as if they're transfers between states. You know, New Jersey doesn't subsidize uh, Indiana. But there, there are transfers between individual people who have entitlements and claims. And so th 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 that's one area, I think, where there's also the making of a grand bargain in some of this. All right, so this question is about Eastern Europe. I suppose the reason is I'd prefer my Polish passport stays an EU passport. Um, so how do you view Brussels or just European leadership strategy towards countries like Poland broadly, specifically within the context of a couple of things? So I think 
first of all, within the context of these, like the threat of Article 7, not really leading to much change, I think, within pieces decision making. I think today it came out, they're like nominally willing to say some things differently about the rule of law, but it seems peace is getting worse, not better. Um, secondly, how do you view it? considering the growing friendship with Hungary, meaning there's not much European leadership can do because they can't get unanimity in decision-making. And then thirdly, sort of in the light of an increasing Eastern presence in Eastern Europe with things like 16 plus one coming from Asia. Please okay, let's, oh, let's we can do a second round. <laughs> or do you want to, uh, because of, you know, to Eastern That's Europe? Related, okay, let, okay, Oleg. I had a question for John. So, uh, to take a more neutral example than you could, say Northern and Southern Italy decide to separate, and you have transfers from North to South, right? At the time when they decide to separate, should North pay just a big lump sum to the South? I mean, because a lot of these things are not about public goods that North can provide its own and South can provide its own, but it's about actually the transfers and sort of uh, to support the cost theorem, you need a transfer. So, you know, and, and you can think about it in case of like the banking, you know, who, who will bail out the banks, it's the national government or the whole Eurozone and so on. I mean, obviously Spain is similar, Greece is similar. And so the second quick remark I had is, um, so Samaya mentioned that uh, sort of Europe has used to outsource institutions, right? Very few countries manage to transition from developing sta status to developed st status. And so one of the big concerns of Greece left was, I mean, of course they could use their own currency, they could default and that could resolve some of the economic questions, but then in terms of political institutions, would they converge to Poland and Hungary uh, if, if they left? Or like the fact that they stay within the Eurozone that maybe helps them converge over the long run towards the German and uh, you know French institutions rather than to sort of the Less, less, less good institutions. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the questions. Uh, first, um, let me ask. Uh, Marcus has about the, talked about the principle of subsidiarity. Uh, obviously, uh, seems like a natural principle. The question is obviously the the, the application of it. It's not. Um, it seems reasonable to have. Uh, uh, services provided at, uh, at the closest level, but uh, the, the issue is the, the application still. The application is, uh, I think that some rules at the European level on, on those would also be interesting, but I don't have much to add. With the willingness to share risks, I think that this is something that um, it's also related to your, your question at some level. The willingness to share risks, uh, it seems to be limited within the European Union, basically because what is many times asked, there are two very different concepts. One concept is a concept of sharing risks. The other concept is a concept of uh, permanent, permanent transfers from the rich parts to the poor parts. I think that everybody would be in agreement, everybody would be in agreement of uh, some sort of risk sharing that cannot be, uh, that cannot worsen anybody. The other question is whether uh, hidden in this sharing of risks, there is a permanent transfer or an expected transfer. And here, then we're entering into another issue. Uh, we're entering into another issue, whether redistribution should be done at the individual level or at the territorial level. And this uh, issue of whether distribution should be done at the territorial or at the individual level is a complicated matter that at the end of the day is, has to be resolved by your tastes. What do we want to do? What do we prefer? It's a political issue. It seems that there is not much uh, willingness to do that. With respect to the, the issue that uh, Oleg was uh, mentioning, uh, whether you kindly said uh, northern and southern Italy, uh, not to <laughs> mention other 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 um, other situations that are closer to my <laughs> my heart. Uh, um, um, what what can I say? Um, once there is a negotiation, as you as you mentioned, the cost theorem would tell you that the outcome should be efficient. Uh, what it has to be is some sort of protocol. There has to be some protocol that is not decided by one of the parts. It's decided uh, at a higher level, at a European level, on how to solve conflicts about that. How one, uh, there is a fraction of the population, the European population, that wants to change the jurisdiction. How do you resolve that? There is no protocol. Uh, we are now in a situation in which um, the whole discussion that you are mentioning cannot be put on the table. 
uh, weather in particular circumstance. Um, this requires uh, an agreement of the one part or the other, whether a transfer has to be made or not. Everything is possible. I, I don't, not in disagreement with that. I, I will not talk about Poland um, because I am not uh, that familiar about the details of uh, what is going on. Okay. okay, so the the, four, the first point was about whether um, uh, you know on Brexit as a Europe as a unifying force, and maybe that would lead to some kind of and that was linked ooh, to, to your your question about some kind of grand bargain on defence. Um, so I suppose I don't. I'm not going to kind of. I'm not so self confident that I I could say that that definitely won't happen. The the grand the grand bargain on defence. Uh, I suppose that the the things that um, I would note that would make me think that that might be less likely is that um, first of all, in in the you know the the technocratic discussions kind of being thrown around the ECB and the IMF, it's it generally seems like there's a kind of economic silo. Um, the the you know the the window of opportunity to do reform again that's mentioned in, with reference to the Eurozone finance ministers meeting in in June. So if there were to be such a big grand bargain on defense, then I suppose that would need to be taken at a high level. Um, and it's not clear that um, at this time there is the political will to kind of override the economic concerns to get that to get that security, um, even if it might that might be the best thing to do. Um, on the and, and and then the other thing that I would say is that uh, um, it's kind of been notable that that often when these proposals are being discussed, there are several that have uh, nasty side effects. And so the solution to that is that, oh, well, you need to do these, these few reforms at the same time, right? If you're worried about the transition to debt being treated differently, then you need to do this at the same time, right? Increase banks loss absorbency or something, right? So there's already a kind of bundling within that, and that's already a bit difficult. Um, so the kind of the bigger the bundling, I suppose the 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 riskier the strategy, right? If it just turns out that one of the one of the bits of the bundle just isn't enough at that precise moment, then do you do you lose the whole thing, or do you focus on the smaller things? Um, and it and um, the, you know the noises out of Brussels kind of makes it seem like they're going to try and sequence some of this stuff. You know, there will be you know the first round will be trying to do some elements of banking union, uh, maybe something a bit after that on on the European Monetary Fund. Um, you know, I know I talked about this kind of the window of opportunity and all these proposals, but it, you know, I guess the worry is that it would all happen in in such a slow drip that it would be difficult to get the kind of grand bargain on defence, even if, um, you know, th even if that would actually make getting big fixes a lot, even if that would make it much easier. Um, on uh, the. EU strategy towards Poland. So I'm also going to confess that this is not my deep area of expertise. I mean, I do know that the European Union, the EU has massive problems, right? The, you know, it has it has much more control over countries when they're in the accession process than it has over them when they're in, right? That that kind of that's a sort of incentives problem that it hasn't really dealt with. You know, whether some of these newfangled financial instruments would give them more. Uh, credible sticks with which to whack countries. I don't know, um, but uh, you know when 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 you think of a solution, then let me know and I'll send a few emails. Uh, <laughs> um, the, uh, the 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 point about the um, the adjustment mechanism um, using labor mo labor mobility, right? And so you know clearly the the EU does have some adjustment mechanisms. Um, uh, as one of the things I did to prepare for this talk, I went back and read um, Mundell, which is a, a riveting read. Um, uh, and 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 you know, and, and any chart that looks into kind of you know whether the EU is an optimal currency area concludes that it really isn't. Uh, the classic the classic chart is to look at kind of labor labor mobility within the EU and just kind of note how much lower it is relative to the US. Um, people just don't move as much. Um, and then, and then you get it's still <laughs> uh yeah so in the in the u s obviously it's kind of um been been declining uh you know convergence you know the u s income convergence between states was also kind of rising and then has stalled since the nineteen seventies so using the u s as this kind of amazing example isn't perfect either, but 
in levels, labor mobility in the EU is um, much lower than, than in, in the US. Um, and, and the point you made about, yeah, running away from debt, that seems to be um, the real problem there. So, so um, it was really striking. So I spoke to, uh, I was talking to someone um, uh, within the EU and, and one, of, one of the proposals that came, came out recently, I think from the European Commission, was for some big new uh, spending program, right? And, and this was going to help, uh, um, you know, perform some of that fiscal stabilization function. Um, and before this proposal had been announced, there was this, you know, one option was maybe you could have some kind of European-wide unemployment fund. And then the other option was that you could have some kind of European-wide investment fund. Um, and clearly, you know, although it's possible to have a um, counter-cyclical investment fund, uh, you know, the idea was the justification for them actually picking an investment fund was that, oh, well, then you can just spend money on investment projects whenever they need to be funded, right? So, so something happened, essentially, that meant that the unemployment idea got killed. Um, for some reason, it was deemed too politically toxic, and they went for the investment fund, which is, isn't automatic um, in its kind of counter-cyclical counter uh, properties. Um, so again, that made me kind of, uh, you know, worry that, that the idea of having some kind of future European adjustment mechanism, European level adjustment mechanism, based on unemployment benefits was was uh, more politically difficult than than might be optimal. Sorry. So let me just add to the Polish question uh, something. I just want to put it uh, a little bit more nuanced. I think the first one has to recognize that the transition of uh, Eastern or Central Europe after the, the Berlin Wall came down was an extreme success story. It would not have happened with the, without the European Union. So the benchmark is essentially much worse. It could have gone much, much worse. So this was a huge success story. In economically, it's still a huge success story. And the, the question is very much, there's a huge challenge out there whether the Western values can prevail. And I think the European Union will play a very critical role. And I think also Austria will play a very critical role because Austria will be the binding uh, element between the, uh, Hungary and and uh, Poland and these states and there, that's essentially the bridging role they have. And Austria has, from its political perspective, a uh, very young chancellor is more right wing and he might be able to play a special role in there. Uh, hopefully, that's the optimistic uh, interpretation. Um, let me leave it at that. So, so let me open up to more questions. We have about ten minutes, so then we should. Perhaps work one more round. Um, Jaume, is it Jaume or Jaume, by the way? Jaume, Jaume sorry. Um, I wanted to ask a question regarding like the, the, the way you've periodized effectively a 19th century state, a 20th century state, 21st century state. I wanted to ask whether you think that's, it's, a, it's even possible to discuss the changes that have happened in the first wave of globalization, the second wave of globalization, without discussing the reality of empire. And the way, and especially with the, regarding the number of states, like the initial wave, first wave of globalization occurred during an age of imperialism where states were consolidated through force and like power. And then this, the political disintegration we see now also is, in, is happening in a moment when though there's no more big stick diplomacy, there's more sticks with which to whack countries, as you said, Sumaya. There's other mechanisms that don't require like, military or marines, but they, but like the EU is able to impose certain like, rules on a member state like Greece through institutional mechanisms that are peaceful in like in terms of like there's no need for military to get Greece to pay its debt etc but i just wanted to like bring up just the re the reality that a lot of these like the political conflicts and the sizes of states and these issues here are it can, I don't think they can be discussed without considering the role of empire and the ability to impose power without the use of empire today. But I just wanted to see your thoughts on that and incorporate that part into the narrative and somehow. Thank you. Any more questions? Other men? Thank you. Yeah, also for uh, for Jeremy. So I wonder also in the, in uh, in the narrative whether you should not also talk about um, the bargaining power that you have when you are a, a big economic area, especially vis-à-vis -vis, uh, multinational companies, for example. 
Uh, <laughs> we know that one of the strengths of Europe has been, for example, the competition policy, right? Which the US has more or less seemed to have been given up a lot more than in Europe. And uh, how, st how strong you are depends clearly on how big you are as an economic area. But so this kind of uh, strength in the in the size, then um, also comes with, um, if you are going to divide within Europe in lots of little jurisdictions according to different preferences for other things or whatever, the problem with that is then the decision-making power uh, at the EU level. So the EU is an indirect democracy, okay? It is the, effectively the Council of Europe, which is the head of states, which is making calling the shots in Europe. So it is a democracy, but kind of indirect for the head of states. And if you, we are going to multiply the number of jurisdictions and we go, you know, we've gone from six to now 28. And, and if you are going to add some more to that, then uh, the, the political decision making becomes effectively the process becomes somewhat intractable. So I wonder if you have thought a little bit more about that, how you resolve all these, uh, all these issues. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and, and maybe just to add to the Brexit problems, I think it's the more we go into Brexit, the more obviously the incompetence of a lot of people shows up, but uh, also the more you see how intricately linked a number of issues are. Okay, so in the, the trade policy, it turns out it's hard to talk about it if you then you, you, you don't talk also about uh, so all the staff linked to non tariff barriers, and then you are want, may want to talk about corporate tax raise to the bottom and to, to go back to Danny's charts, etc. So all these things come together uh, and um, uh, so, so again, if you are going to have a lot of overlapping jurisdictions <laughs> uh, on these different matters, you, you effectively you, you, you can't progress. And in a way, the, the UK is stuck right now. Okay, so let's have two quick responses. And then if there's one last question, I can take it in. But otherwise, we cl Moritz, very quickly. Then I finish where Harold started. So what are the precise ideas for risk sharing in the Eurozone that does not lead to what, what John may correctly call like effectively transfer union? So risk sharing union that really where the, so the, the tr over time there is zero transfers. What are the precise ideas that we should think about really hard? I should qualify Moritz is German. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you want to go first. Answer the question. <laughs> you, you've got to answer that question. <laughs> I'm not joking. Okay, I will go at the end. Okay. You, you go first. Okay. Um, uh, thanks again for the questions. Yes, uh, the question on empires. Uh, you cannot think about this political uh, evolution without empires. Let me give you first a technical answer and then another answer. Basically, one of the things that was learned in the early literature and that also, and also applies now, is that the way in which um, the borders are changed, it doesn't matter that much for the prediction that globalization will have those effects on the, on, the, on the large countries. The reason is that the incentives are going the same direction. So whether you make the choice in a negotiated way through diplomacy or you make the choice by force uh, in war and conflict is the same. All these models in general do have the two types of equilibria. Some of them are equilibria where there is some conflict and way of imposing your force. Some others that uh, it's through the diplomacy and the models deliver the same, the same uh, answer. That's the technical answer. But in fact, in a more than technical answer, this is exactly what happens. What a model tells you is that at the early stages of globalization, what you want to do is to make the borders as wide as possible so that you conduct most of the trade inside the border. And actually, that's what the empires did. Most of the trade during the 19th century was within the empires. Across empires, they were at war most of the time. So, uh, in fact, most of the trade was within the borders. When you move to that level of having two uh, level state uh, with some smaller jurisdiction for some policies and some larger jurisdiction when it comes to economics, the effect is not, you don't remove the borders. You minimize the, the negative effect of that border by harmonizing policies and by making sure that decisions are made at a level that internalizes all the possible externalities. But in that case, you keep the borders and you basically minimize the cost of trade across borders. While in the 19th century, the question was make the borders as wide as possible and make most of the trade within the borders. I think that actually data on trade 
is very consistent with that. So the empires have a big uh, role. Um, in fact, um, this nicely links to what Delenn asked about the bargaining power against, for example, big multinationals. This is one of the clear externalities. Countries nowadays, they cannot impose many policies because uh, firms move to another place, because they, um, they, um, they indeed uh, uh, blackmail governments in a variety of ways. Perhaps blackmail is too strong, but I don't think so. But <laughs> they do, they do uh, force governments to, uh, to adopt certain policies that they don't want. This is much more difficult with a large government that regulates economic interactions. So that I agree totally. Now, um, so I think that that's one of the important successes of the European Union, and it's not inconsistent at all with this view. In fact, it's the reason why we want to move economic decisions at a higher level. I don't see, I don't see once we move at a higher level, the fact that there are smaller units as a problem for political stability. But actually, I see it mostly as a requirement. Most of the models that we have, on, for example, when we have to make decisions, if there are two or three big players, things tend to be many times uh, uh, less perceived, uh, more, can be more unstable. Sometimes it can be, sometimes they might be less stable, but certainly they will be perceived uh, as less legitimate for many of the other persons. In, if you have a political system where there are many players that they vote, in fact, that will give more power to the union, and that I think is going to uh, facilitate economic stability. Um, that's a matter of, uh, of opinion. But for example, I imagine that, uh, for example, the United States would be much less stable as a federation if it had like two or three states that were the size of Germany. Uh, uh, that would be the larger states are smaller. And in fact, if you look back at the history of the United States, uh, uh, when Texas came in, it was broken down in pieces. The early states were extended, uh, were extended, and they were, and they were some of them cut down. So I think that this has helped to the stability of the United States, and it might also be the case in Europe. It's. <laughs> I, I don't want to cut down Germany or not cut down Germany. I don't want to cut it down or not. Uh, uh, I, I just don't. Uh, um, that's it. Yeah, yeah, can I? Yeah. yeah of course. So, so I'm just going to. Um, so I have a hard stop as a taxi is arriving to pick me up to go to the airport in one minute. Um, so I just uh, just wanted to say something quick about about Brexit. So there's this there's this model um, that some people uh, have of 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 why Britain voted to leave the EU, and I think it's one about sovereignty. Um, it's one that there's this man called Daniel Hannan who who was a liberal leaver, and his idea was that you know the the EU restricted it restricted the ability of of uh, the UK to negotiate its amazing trade deals with India and China, and these were the growing countries. The EU tied Britain's hands, and it took too much control. Um, you know, the, the, um, it, uh, it, it, it undermined British sovereignty, and that was a problem. And Britons on Ju June 23rd voted against that. There's another model of, Britain, of, Bre of Brexit, which um, is slightly more along the lines of what Danny was talking about earlier, which is a kind of undermine, underlying demand uh, caused by kind of long-term, you know, stagnant wage growth, uh, the lingering effects of the, the financial crisis, and then a kind of populist supply. Uh, so the alternative model of Brexit is one in which there was a kind of, you know, long term, decades long process of misinformation. You know, the idea that, that the EU regulated the shape of bananas, um, uh, kind of misinformation about what the EU was doing. Um, and then when the vote happened, a kind of ambiguity about what it actually meant. Um, misinformation about the costs of disentangling Britain's institutions from the EU, which is still not become apparent, but is, you know, becoming slowly apparent. Um, understating the economic costs, but also just the complexity of doing it being just too difficult to understand. And, and the kind of the, the, you know, the take back control uh, message overwhelming that. Um, so there's a kind of there is an intellectual justification for for Britain um, leaving the European Union, but um, I worry that the the mechanisms by which it happened don't reflect that kind of intellectual argument in favour of it. Thanks a lot for all of you to all of you, and uh, hope to see you next year again. Atif will tell you the topic, and uh, for all the help for all the the Alexa, uh,
Thank you.